Hello everybody and welcome back to another true crime video and hello if you are new here I'm Becky and I do true crime videos. Um, I know I need to be looking in the camera not in the screen I'm sorry I really need to get better at that. We have 353 friends Thank you so much for everybody who has shown support. I really, really appreciate it. Actually, my last true crime video, thank you so, so, so much. You guys are my motivation and you keep me going to post each video. So thank you so much. I just appreciate you so, so much. Today's case is very graphic, so your discretion is advised. The case is on the kidnapping of Jennifer Schuett. I will list all the trigger warnings here. It was the summer of 1990 and Jennifer Schuett had just finished the second grade. Jennifer said how she loved life and school as she loved to learn. It was August 9th, 1990. Jennifer was afraid of the dark, so often slept in her mom's room. That night, Jennifer was very restless and her mom turned around and said, You are kicking me in your sleep and I have work in the morning. Would you mind going into your own room tonight? Jennifer turned around and said, just because I love you, Mom, I'm going to sleep in my own room tonight. Jennifer went into her own room, turned on her big, bright lamp that was shaped like a light bulb, and read until she fell asleep. Then, all of a sudden, Jennifer woke up to an unknown man carrying her in his arms, running down the sidewalk. Jennifer tried to scream, but he covered her nose and mouth. The man sat her on his lap, as he was driving, and he tried to calm Jennifer down, saying, everything's gonna be okay, I'm an undercover police officer. Jennifer wanted to believe the man, but she had just learned about stranger danger in school, and the other part of Jennifer that was afraid of the dark knew that something really wasn't right here. As they were driving, that's when Jennifer realized that she had actually been kidnapped. Eight-year-old Jennifer went into panic, not knowing what was about to happen to her. The man pulled into the parking lot of her elementary school. He told Jennifer that her mom would be pulling in the parking lot to pick her up. Jennifer anxiously waited for her mom's car, but it never came. He then turned to Jennifer and said, Well, your mom's not coming, and started up the car. They traveled just a few blocks away to a dead-end gravel road. The man then pulled off into an overgrown field. Jennifer asked a lot of questions, like where is your badge and gun if you are a police officer? He answered saying that the gun was in his back seat. Jennifer went to look for herself and turned around. The man did not like this and turned aggressive. He then ripped off her clothes and started licking her body. He then held a knife to Jennifer's throat and said, Am I scaring you, little girl? Am I scaring you? The man choked Jennifer as hard as he could, and he also tried to break her neck. Jennifer kept going in and out of consciousness. Jennifer woke up to him dragging her by the ankles through this overgrown field. She pretended to be dead. Then the man dropped her legs and walked off. She could hear him slam the car door and drive away. Jennifer realized she couldn't scream. She mustered just enough strength to throw her right hand on top of her neck. Jennifer then felt a very large gaping wound. Her hand was covered in blood. Jennifer was just eight years old, and she was left to die in a field. In the morning of August 10th, 1990, Jennifer's mother entered her bedroom and found the bedroom window open and her daughter gone. She alerted police that her daughter was abducted. At the time, Dickinson Police Department was a very, very small agency. The police decided it was best to go ahead and try and assemble the fire department and any other volunteers that would be willing to help and search for Jennifer in fields nearby. Miraculously, Jennifer was still alive the next day. Jennifer was in a very bad condition. She couldn't move her body. When the man dumped Jennifer's body in the field, he dumped her body over an ant hill. These ants were crawling all over Jennifer's body and stinging her. Jennifer kept going in and out of consciousness. The only reason why she kept waking up was because of the ants stinging her. 
Jennifer was just lying there, and she was looking through the tall blades of grass, and she could see these cars passing. But she couldn't do anything. She couldn't even signal for help. It was early evening, and it was getting dark outside. It was the last time she woke up, she heard children playing. And then all of a sudden, she felt something hit her foot. These children were playing in this field, and one of them had tripped over Jennifer's foot, thinking she had actually found one of her playmates. And that's how Jennifer was found. Eight-year-old Jennifer had lay in a field for 12 hours before she was discovered. She woke up to a police officer kneeling down beside her, saying, You've been found and you're going to be okay. Please just stay with me. And then she was put into a life flight helicopter rushing her to the hospital. Jennifer's throat had been cut ear to ear, and she was also very badly assaulted that left her infertile. Jennifer couldn't communicate as she couldn't speak. Jennifer was panicked because there was a police officer outside of the hospital door, and obviously the man that took her said that how he was an undercover police officer. Jennifer said she couldn't even trust the male doctors, as everyone was a suspect in her book. Communication was the main barrier. As Jennifer couldn't speak with the officers, she had to write down notes to her mother, and then her mother would give it to the officers outside. Jennifer gave so much detail. She gave his name, which she wrote down. He said his name was Dennis. She remembered his appearance, quoting that he looked greasy and may have had a scar or something on his face. Jennifer also described the car to a T, the colors, and the dent in the side of it. She wrote down that there was beer cans in the car, the brand of cigarettes that he had, and literally every detail that she could remember. I mean, this is just simply amazing, no matter what age you are, but it's the fact she was an eight-year-old little girl that has just went through this extremely traumatic event, and she was almost murdered, and she could remember all of these details. But years passed, and there were still no leads, and the attacker in the attack was always in the back of Jennifer's mind. She recalls how she was so traumatized, and that she didn't really ever want to be home alone, especially at night, and she was very fearful of men. Then it was 10 years after the attack. Jennifer went on and graduated high school and started attending college. Then she worked as a children's librarian at a local public library. She recalled how much she loved that job. Jennifer's case was getting passed to different officers and nothing was really being solved until January 2008. The case was handed to Detective Cromie and Agent Renison. Agent Renison worked for the FBI, and Detective Cromie worked for the Dickinson Police Department. They teamed up together to solve Jennifer's case. There had been new advances in DNA technology, so this was a big benefit for Jennifer's case. They picked out four pieces of evidence to send away to the FBI labs, which was Jennifer's t-shirt, underwear, and the male's underwear and t-shirt. This was now an 18-year-old cold case, so it didn't have priority up in the FBI lab. It was 19 years after Jennifer's vicious attack. At 2.30 in the morning, Agent Renison got a phone call. It was from the DNA lab. There was a match. Jennifer's attacker was Dennis Earl Bradford. Bradford had other previous offenses. In 1996, he assaulted a woman in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he was also convicted of kidnapping and he was sentenced to 12 years in prison, but only served four. He was out of prison by 2000 and he had gotten married and had children of his own. He also had stepchildren. He had lived a pretty normal life and worked as a welder up until the day he was arrested in 2009. They could establish that Dennis Earl Bradford had at least two different addresses in Dickinson during the time of Jennifer's attack. Both places were very close proximity to Jennifer and her mother's apartment. They were able to obtain a photograph from Bradford's driving license. 
This photo was taken only a few months before the attack on Jennifer. The resemblance to the suspect sketch in this photo is striking. Everyone was preparing for trial, and they felt like they had a pretty solid case. His attorney said that Bradford was just going to plead guilty, as he didn't want to prolong this anymore. So all they had to do was pick a day. They decided to pick August 10th, which would have been 20 years to the day of the attack. Bradford was in county jail awaiting trial. And in the middle of the night, Jennifer gets a phone call to say, Dennis Earl Bradford had ended his life and hung himself in his jail cell. Jennifer sat at Dennis Bradford's grave on August 10th, 2010, and read her victim impact statement. She turned to her husband and said, I wonder if he's hearing me. And then all of a sudden, a single fire amp bit her on the leg, and she took that as a sign that he heard her loud and clear. Amazingly, even though doctors said that Jennifer would be infertile due to her attack, she has been able to have two children, a daughter and a son. Jennifer is now a fierce advocator for other crime survivors, and she still remains close to those who helped solve her case. Well, that is the end of today's video. Thank you so much for watching, and let me know what you thought of Jennifer's story. Would you like me to do more survival stories? Let me know down below. And as always, 